Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ahmadu wa subhanahu wa salli ala rasulil kareem. Now, in, in this seminar, I want to look at uh, the problems uh, that we encounter in trying to uh, give da'wah in our present uh, uh, milieu, in troubling times. Post 9-11, people have be begun to describe our times as uh, difficult times or times of trouble. Uh, but the troubles for the da'i, in fact, has been ongoing for millennia. In the Quran, we read about Allah sending prophets and messengers to give the call of Islam uh, in many different situations. And if we look at uh, the descriptions of the Quran, we see that uh, the prophets generally had difficulties in trying to convey their, their messages. Think of the Prophet Nuh In Surah 23, uh, Surah uh, uh, Al-Mu'minun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ فَقَالَ يَا قَوْمِ أَبُدُ اللَّهَ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَٰهٍ غَيْرُهُ أَفَلَا تَتَّقُونَ We have certainly sent Noah to his people saying, O oh my people, uh, have no other for God except uh, Allah. Uh, will you not pay heed? But uh, instead of his people paying heed, uh, they decided to... Uh, take his life. And Nuh alayhi salam complained to Allah azza wa jal about their plot and uh, plead, pleaded to Allah for his own safety. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the inspiration to construct an, an ark. And then we gave him the inspiration uh, to construct this uh, ark under our very supervision. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the command that he is to enter the ark, he and those faithful believers with him who are only few. Uh, and, and they are the ones that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had rescued uh, when he sent the great flood that wiped out those who disbelieved. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, uh, And then we sent uh, in their stead, Another people. And then we sent a messenger to them, giving them the same message, which we have already seen from Nuh uh, alayhi salam. O people, you have no other for God except the one God. Are you not going to pay heed? And what was the response uh, of these people? The response described in that surah, surah 23, uh, is that uh, these people said, why should we believe in this man, that this man who says he's a prophet of God? He's just a simple man, ordinary human being, he walks in the streets like the rest of us, he goes to the marketplaces. In other words, they expect that the prophet or messenger of God should be something like an angel out of this world, maybe just simply drop down from the, from the sky like a superman or iron man or whatever. Uh, but they see that the prophet is an ordinary human being and they're asking why should we listen to this prophet? Uh, plus, the message seems to be about uh, uh, some uh, resurrection from the dead, and they find this to be unbelievable. How will it so happen that all of our previous generations, all of our ancestors, long dead, rotten by now, uh, how are they going to resurrect from the dead and, and meet God again for judgment? So they found all of this uh, very difficult uh, to believe, especially the people who are well-to-do. As for those who are, are well-to-do, the mutrafu uh, in, in the, in the uh, earth, uh, they, they say, uh, this man is, is only an ordinary human being. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that when this prophet complained to Allah, and he said, Rabbi, ansurni bima kazzabun, Oh Allah, help me because of the fact that they are now disbelieving. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and Allah assured the Prophet, it's only going to be for a little time. 
and then they are going to face the punishment. When the punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came, that is when they became uh, repentant for their deeds. So this has been the ongoing saga throughout history. After this prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, arsalna min ba'dihim akharin. Then we sent uh, in their wake many nations, one after another. And then we, we sent our messengers following one after another. And whenever a, a, a messenger comes to his people, they deny him. So you see, this is not a new thing. It's not only for us. This has been happening throughout history. Uh, people are going to respond in two ways to the message of Allah. Some will believe, they will accept, and some will disbelieve, they will reject. Our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was not an exception to this. Today we get all riled up if somebody draws a cartoon about our Prophet وسلم, or they mock him or ridicule him uh, to the extent that somebody is upset even if you name a teddy bear Muhammad, uh, which might have been from the point of view of that person something cute. So we get so emotional uh, because we are not accustomed to giving the message and receiving the response. The response to our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was also a, a, a two-pronged. Some people believed in him. There were few, especially in the early days. But those who disbelieved in him were many. And they had power. They had influence. They could harm him. They could hurt him. And they could persecute the early Muslims. And this is precisely what they did. In uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, we read uh, that Ibn Omar, the son of Omar radiallahu an, said that uh, in the early days, uh, the uh, uh, non-Muslims used to persecute the Muslims. They would tie them up and beat them and even kill them. That was in the early days when the Prophet sallallahu was giving the call in Mecca. But this was the way of Allah azawajal, to allow his Prophet, his messenger, his Habib, his beloved, to give the message of Islam in those difficult and troubling times. People will ridicule. But our Prophet وسلم, the beloved of Allah, still had to face all of that ridicule and give the message. On one occasion, as the Prophet وسلم, was uh, praying uh, in the Masjid al-Haram, uh, one of the non-Muslims brought the entrails of a newly slaughtered camel and placed it upon the blessed head of the Prophet وسلم. On another occasion, uh, the Prophet peace be upon him was praying peacefully again in the Masjid al-Haram, but at this time, as you know, the, both the Muslims and non-Muslims were peopling that uh, sacred uh, space for worship. And uh, the non-Muslims again instigated each other, and one of them, a man by the name of uh, Uqba bin Abi Mu'ayt, brought a sheet and wrapped it around the neck of the Prophet وسلم, and pulled it so hard that our Prophet fell unconscious. And Abu Bakr thought that, that the Prophet might die as a result of this. He stood up and he said, Are you going to kill a man just because he says, My Lord is Allah? And, and the Prophet وسلم, survived that incident. But he continued to preach his message as before. You see, nothing would stop him. It doesn't matter uh, what, what circumstances he faces. He always continued to give the message. As you know, the Prophet ﷺ was orphaned before he even uh, entered this world. His uh, father passed away when he, his mother was still pregnant with him. And then uh, soon after that, uh, within a few years, his mother also passed away. And he was placed in the care of his uh, grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. And he also died within a few years, and that left him in the care of his uncle, Abu Talib. Abu Talib, uh, uh, Abu Talib looked after the Prophet ﷺ like a son. He loved him, and he took care of him. And uh, when the Prophet ﷺ began preaching, Abu Talib stuck to the religion of his forefathers. But he nevertheless supported the Prophet ﷺ. And because of his influence in Quraysh society, uh, it, it was not possible to take the life of the Prophet ﷺ uh, without uh, dealing with the repercussions from such a man of influence. So for this reason, persecutions on the Prophet ﷺ stopped short. Uh, of taking his life. But then, uh, they, these people tried to put pressure on Abu Talib to withdraw his protection from the Prophet. If Abu Talib would disown him, they would have the free hand to kill him. So Abu Talib was now caught between a rock and a hard place. He called his nephew and he said, uh, 
this is what is happening now. You're, you're making things difficult for me. Can you not just simply stop this message? Because you're upsetting my people. And the Prophet ﷺ felt that the time has now come for Abu Talib to withdraw his protection. And the Prophet turned to leave. But he said, my uncle, even if they put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left, I will not give up this mission until either Allah makes it successful or I die in the process. So he was determined that with support or without support, he will give the da'wah, he will give that call, which was the call of the previous prophets. Nothing would, would stop him. And his uncle said to him, you go my nephew and say whatever you want, I will protect you. But Abu Talib also died. That was the year of sadness, the Am al Huzn in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, the tenth year of the mission. And this is when the Prophet ﷺ decided that Mecca is too hot for him. He has to go to other places and see if perhaps other people might accept the message. He went to Ta'if, about two miles away from Mecca, to give the message there. But instead of the people accepting his message, they jeered at him, they mocked him. So we think mockery of the Prophet is something new. This is the, already there in his seerah. And then they wouldn't even let him leave in peace. They stoned him. The feet of the Prophet bled on that occasion. When he came to a position of safety outside of the town, he raised his hands in dua and he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, for his protection and for his mercy. And he says that he complains of his own inabilities his own lack of persuasion, per persuasive power and, and ability to influence the people. And in the end, he says that the only thing that matters to him in all of this is that Allah should be pleased with him. He seeks only wajh Allah, only the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, face of Allah. And uh, some commentators say that it is in response to this dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called him up into the high heavens when he exper exper ex experienced al-Isra while Mi'raj. Because he was here being rejected on the earth. He was seeking the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called him close uh, to himself. But that shows the, the situations in which our Prophet found himself. He had to continue giving the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah was there protecting him. Now on that occasion when the Prophet was so hurt by the people of Ta'if it is reported in his biographies that uh, the angel Jibreel alayhi came down and said to him, look, I have with me here the angel in charge of the mountain surrounding this town. If you just give the okay, uh, the angel will bring the mountains together, crushing the people who had treated you so badly. But the Prophet sallallahu said, no. I hope that from among their progeny, there will be some who will say, la ilaha illallah. So he, on that occasion, showed that he was indeed a mercy to the people. And Allah tells us in Surah 21, Surah Al-Anbiya, in verse number 107, We have not sent you, O Muhammad, except as a mercy to the nations. That is how Allah sent him, as a mercy to al alamin to the world. And he showed that he was indeed that. Many people misunderstand the life of the Prophet ﷺ. They think that the Prophet peace be upon him uh, was a man of violence, as if he had to spread his religion by the sword. They thought that the Prophet ﷺ was out to kill people. And the reverse is true. He was not out to kill people, but to save them. He wanted to give them that saving message that will bring them to life everlasting in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this was an occasion in which this was demonstrated. The Prophet ﷺ had to leave Mecca. These were troubling times. These were difficult times in the life of our Prophet ﷺ. In the same year that we described as Am al Huzn, the, life, the year of sadness, his wife Khadija, who had stood by his wife Khadija, who had stood by his side in all of these years, comforting him, also passed away. So the Prophet was without mother, without father, without his dear wife. His uh, grandfather who protected him was gone. His uncle who protected him was also now gone. 
but the Prophet ﷺ was developing a community. He had a few followers with him. Many of them are were without influence. They were being persecuted in Mecca precisely because they had nobody to protect them and no influence, uh, to, to, no people of influence uh, on, on whom to rely. The Prophet ﷺ had to migrate. He left that situation of violence and he went to live in peace in Medina, a city about 250 uh, kilometers to the north or 250 miles uh, to, to the north. But even there he was not left to live in peace. Because the non-Muslim armies came after him in one battle after another. Battle of Badr, Battle of Uhud, Battle of Khanda. The Prophet ﷺ had to defend his community in all of these battles from the onslaught of the enemies. Eventually, when the Prophet ﷺ goes back into Mecca, now with a large following, now he takes over the city. The city is handed over to him. There's nothing to do but to give him the city. He has now amassed such a great power that it would have been futile to resist him. And that on that occasion, those who persecuted the Muslims were afraid. They thought that now comes the general who, now in power, will take revenge for all of the persecutions. But what did the Prophet ﷺ do in this occasion? He made circumambulation of the Kaaba. And he declared that anyone who goes to the house of Abu Sufyan, the then Meccan ruler, would be safe. Anyone who stays in this house would be safe. In other words, only those who come out fighting have anything to worry about. He declared a general amnesty. And he said to the public, I will tell you what the Prophet Yusuf said to his brothers. What did Yusuf say to his brothers? Yusuf was also a man of da'wah. He was a prophet of Allah Azawajal. His story is in the 12th chapter of the Quran. His brothers had plotted against his life, but they took a lesser course and they left him in a well to be picked up and taken away. A caravan passed by and took him into Egypt where he was sold as a slave. He went through many years of difficulty. He was put into prison. And in prison he gave da'wah. Because this is the attitude of the one who knows that he has a message to deliver, whether he's in prison or not, wherever he is, whatever the circumstances, whatever troubling times, he gives the message of Allah Azawajal. So he talks to his prison inmates. He asks them, what, what is better? Uh, all of the gods that you worship, the names that have been invented by your forefathers, or the one overwhelming God, Al-Wahid Al-Qahar. So he gives the message of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Eventually he's taken out of prison, or released from prison. He rises uh, in, in the echelons of Egypt. He becomes the virtual ruler. Then his brothers, struck with famine in their land, come to Egypt to find grain. They are now at the mercy of Joseph, of Yusuf a.s. What does Yusuf a.s. do now? He says to them, There should be no blame on you this day. May Allah forgive you. He credited whatever his brothers had done to the inspirations of the shaitan. In other words, in the end, he recognizes that his brothers are good people. Something came between him and his brothers. Shaitan came in between. The Prophet ﷺ now says to the people of Mecca, I will tell you what Joseph said to his brothers. Same thing. There will be no blame on you this day. May Allah forgive you. So he recognizes that there is an inherent goodness in the people. But things came in between. Circumstances were like that. Sometimes we have to understand the people that we're trying to give da'wah to. Sometimes we think the people are evil, they're not going to listen. What's the point of it? Call on the curse of Allah on them. Ra'natullahi alayh. And so on. This comes easily from our tongues. But our Prophet wasallam said about himself, he was not sent as a la'an. He was not sent to curse people. He continued to bless people and pray for their guidance. And this is what we ourselves should do. So in difficult times as we face in, in our present circumstances, we have to remember the example of our Prophet ﷺ. And we have to give the message of Islam as he did. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directs the Prophet in Surah 3, verse number 31, Surah Al-Imran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses him and says, 
قل إن كنتم تحبون الله فاتبعوني say if you love Allah follow me يحببكم الله then Allah will love you ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم and he will forgive you your sins والله غفور رحيم and Allah is forgiving he's merciful so Allah is assuring us in his address to the Prophet ﷺ. So he's speaking directly to the Prophet and indirectly to us. He's saying to his Prophet, tell them, if you love Allah, then follow me. When, would, when might that be said? So imagine somebody coming to the Prophet ﷺ and saying, Messenger of Allah, I love you. So then the response is from Allah, if you really love Allah, you love the Prophet ﷺ, follow him. That's the equation. If one claims, I love Allah, but he's not following the Prophet wasallam, then there is a question mark about that love. So follow the Prophet wasallam, and then what will happen? يُحْبِبُكُمُ اللَّهِ Allah will love you. Imagine, getting the love from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He will forgive your sins. After all, He is Ghafoor rahim So what does it mean to follow the Prophet wasallam? Today when we think of following the Prophet wasallam, we think of a number of things, a thousand and one things that constitute his sunnah. And we want to follow every one of those little things. And that's great. But greater than that is to follow his lifelong mission. There are certain things that he did on occasion. But there is the one thing that constituted his very being. The reason for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send him in the world, it is to de deliver the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That there is only one God, the message of Tawheed. That is the message that the Prophet wasallam was preoccupied with. And he says that this is his way. Back to Surah Yusuf for a moment. In verse number 108, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directs the Prophet again. And says to him, Kul, say, Kul sabili. Say, this is my way. I call towards Allah with clear evidence. I and those who follow me. So the Prophet ﷺ is being told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to declare that this is his way. He makes da'wah. He gives da'wah to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in doing that, he gives clear evidence. But he, he's made to declare that it is not only he that does this da'wah. He and whom? وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي And those who follow me. He and those who follow him will do this da'wah. So we should ask today, where are the people who follow our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa where is the da'wah presented in a consistent, in a clear, and in a professional manner? On the individual level and the community level. On the individual level, each Muslim man and woman, each young man and young woman, each Muslim boy and girl <coughs> should be ready to explain what is Tawheed to the people of this land. People have forgotten. People have confused. They have mixed up the issues. They're not clear as to who exactly they're supposed to worship. They're not exactly certain who is God. If somebody says God, what do they mean and what are they thinking of? Are they thinking of the Creator of the heavens and the earth? Are they thinking God the Father? Are they thinking God the Son? Are they thinking God the Holy Spirit? What do they mean when they say God? Muslims have clarity on this. And they can help others to understand the message of Tawheed. So every one of us should be prepared and ready to give that message. But where are we? In a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, it is recorded that the Prophet ﷺ said, بَلِّغُوا anni walaw ayah." Convey from me, even if it is one ayah, even if it is one verse, we should convey that. And every Muslim knows that, at least one verse. Say, He is Allah, 
One. We know that. That's one verse. We can convey that. It is that one verse that Bilal Radiallahuan was ready to convey. As an individual, he couldn't change all of society. He was in a helpless situation himself. Bilal Radiallahuan embraced Islam when he was a slave. And the woman who owned him didn't like the fact that he embraced Islam. She wanted to pressure him to give up his newfound faith. She hired men to beat him. And they would have him lie on the burning sands of Mecca. They would put a heavy stone on his chest and they'd say to him, Bilal, either you leave Islam or you will die in this condition. But in that situation, Bilal radiallahu anh stuck to his faith. They would drag him through the streets of Mecca and he would be saying, Ahad! Ahad! One! One! In the face of these people who worship 360 idols, for Bilal radiallahu anh, it was sufficient to just give the message that there is only one God. It didn't matter what they did to him. His philosophy was simple. You want to kill me? Go ahead. Make my day. Help me to meet my Lord as a Shaheed. But in these last moments, with my dying breath, I will say, Ahad! Ahad! One! One! So that was Bilal radiallahu anh. Where is Bilal today? I'm not asking if there is somebody with the name Bilal, because there are many. But where are the Bilals who are giving the adhan of Allah in the public like this? Where is the Bilal who is ready to demonstrate himself as a Muslim wherever he is? To live as a Muslim without fear? To show that, yeah, I believe in this faith and I will uphold it in my life. Where are the Muslims who will give this message? At the professional level and as a community effort, much more can be done. And Allah tells us in Surah Ali Imran, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat lin nasi ta'muruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna anil munkar wa tu'minuna billah You are the best nation that has been raised up for humankind. You enjoin what is right and you forbid what is wrong and you believe in Allah. Now think about that for a moment. You are the best nation raised up for mankind. A lot of people just stick with, you are the best nation. And we're happy to say, we Muslims, best nation. But that's not what the ayah says. The ayah says, you are the best nation raised up for mankind. And the for there in English is a translation of what the Arab grammarians refer to as the lamb of ta'lil. A purposive lamb. A lamb that indicates that there is a purpose. So it doesn't stop with you are the best nation, but you are the best nation for a certain purpose, for a certain job, for a task at hand. So if you don't perform that task, what's the sense of saying you are the best nation? If you have a building to construct and we introduce an architect and we say this is the best man for the job, it means he has the qualifications, but if he's not going to do the job, then what's the sense of saying that he's the best man for, for the job? So we have already that quality. the best man for the job means he has the qualifications. But if he's not going to do the job, then what's the sense of saying that he's the best man for, for the job? So we have already that qualification. We have what it takes. We have the monotheism, we have the tawheed, we have the clarity. Are we going to present that to the public? And Allah tells us that this is an obligation. In the same surah. وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرَ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرُ وَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Let there be among you a group who invites towards Allah and enjoins what is right and prevents what is wrong, and these are the ones who will be successful. You notice the closing words. And they are the ones who will be successful. 
So Allah is telling us the way towards success. If you want to be successful as an ummah, what do we have to do? There must be among us a group that invites towards Allah. There must be a da'wah group. There must be a community effort. And the word in the Quran is very clear. Yad'una. They make da'wah. That's the Arabic verb right there. Da'a yad'u. Da'wah as the masdar. As, as the, the origin of that. The source of that verb. So today when we say I have a da'wah in my house, I mean I'm going to cook some food and call my friends over. I have a da'wah to have an invitation, right? But da'wah, in the language of the Quran, essentially is about the message of the prophets. Delivered throughout the ages, in times of trouble, great trouble and difficulty. Attempts were made on their lives. Nuh alayhi salam was threatened. He made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah rescued him. But there were prophets who were killed. Prophets who were sawed in two. Our Prophet sallallahu also faced many difficulties. Today, if somebody makes mockery of our Prophet sallallahu mind you, this is not something new. Our response to that should be one of da'wah. The reason people can say negative things about our Prophet ﷺ is because they have not studied his life. They do not understand him. They misunderstand. They don't really know about him is wrong. So how do we correct that ignorance? By giving the right message. So every man and woman in this room have the responsibility Every man and woman has the responsibility to give that message, to clarify the image about our Prophet ﷺ, to explain what Islam is, to call people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assures us that if we do that, we will be successful. In times of trouble, uh, we just deal with the troubles. We get preoccupied. They're asking about that and they're quarreling about that and we have to fight them about that. But that's not the end of the matter. Yes, we have to do that in parallel. We have to protect our rights and insist uh, on the dignity of Muslims wherever we are. But more than this, the overriding duty that we're failing in, and that is in some sense a cause of some of the troubles, is that duty of da'wah, of calling the people, explaining to them, reasoning with them, debating with them, sharing the literature of Islam with them, giving them the message of Islam on radio, on TV, in the print media. Muslims have to make more concerted efforts to present the message of Islam in a professional way. Many of us are doctors, are engineers, and we want our children to be the same. And even if we're not, we want our children to excel in these great fields. And many Muslim children are, many Muslim youth are in fact channeled in these lines. But it is also very important that we channel some of our youth into the areas of media, of politics, and of journalism. Uh, so that they can, in their own way, influence society through their ideas, through their presentations, through public uh, discussion and civil engagement. In every way, Muslims need to present the message of Islam to the wider public. Wa akhir da'wan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum.